afternoon and uh, welcome to the Environment, Transport and Sustainability Committee. We're all here. Okay. Um, we have some procedural business to get through first of all, so I will ask any members uh, attending um, if they wish to declare as a substitute. We have Councillor Hawtrey instead of Councillor. Yes, Buckley. I'm, as you can see, Councillor Christopher Hawtrey substituting for Councillor Buckley. And I'm sorry to see that Councillor Janio is not here. I don't know if I should be offended by that remark. Uh, it's Councillor Wheel subbing for Councillor Janio. Thank you. I've just, I've just noticed we're missing Geoffrey. He is about, isn't he? Oh, well. He's not run away. Okay. Um, do any members wish to declare an interest in the matters before us on the agenda? No? Okay. And uh, we have no part two items today, so we won't be looking to exclude the press or public at any stage. Oh, here we come. I'm giving the opportunity to declare an interest. Yeah, you might want to ask again. Is it too late? I don't think he's got any, but you might want to just, hmm? you know, you might just want to go back to it and say, Jeffrey, do you have any declarations of interest? So, uh -huh. Just to make sure. Hmm? Right, okay, moving on. On the first page of your agenda, you have the minutes of the previous meeting. Um, do members have any questions of accuracy? At item 83, that is. Are we okay to agree the minutes? Thank you, okay. Um, Right, item 84 is the, previ the minutes of the previous meeting of the Sustainability Partnership, um, which, as you know, I include on the agenda for members' information, so it's just here to be noted. Um, I'd also just like to say that the, um, the City Sustainability Partnership has now had its final meeting and disbanded in favour of the new Biosphere Board. Um, and I'd just like to thank the CSP for all its work. Um, and for members attending, uh, of different partners, including um, members of this committee that have uh, been attendees, Councillor Mitchell and Councillor Janio and myself, uh, Councillor Sykes as well when he was, he was with us. So it's, um, it was a slightly sad time to be uh, finishing, but we were also finishing for a good reason. So thank you to the CSP. Okay, item 25. Um, I beg your pardon. Item 85 on page 25 of your agenda is the um, minutes of the urgency subcommittee. Are committee happy to note the, the decision? Okay. Thank you. Right, item 86, my chair's communications. Well, first of all, I'd like to um, inform those present that this meeting will be webcast live and will be capable of repeated viewing. Um, sadly, this will be our last committee meeting of this council term. Uh, over the past four years, we've, we've worked firstly through the cabinet system, uh, then the separate transport and environment and sustainability committees, and now finally this uh, combined committee. Uh, it has been a busy time for us all uh, in which we have worked hard to achieve an immense amount for the city across all aspects of the committee's brief. Um, just to highlight together, we have implemented 20 mile an hour, making our roads safer and more welcoming for all road users. And we have invested in innovative and key sustainable uh, transport corridors. Um, winning top international awards. We have rebuilt the deadly seven dials and Vogue gyratory junctions as safe places for people to be. Air quality has improved in most areas and with our new low emission zone, we are working in partnership with the buses and taxis to tackle the more stubborn problems. Communal recycling now complements communal waste and it is making, easy, making it easier to recycle and the service redesign that is being conducted will pave the way for further improvement. We have extended parking zones at the request of 
residents and implemented parking management in two of our major parks. And I'm particularly proud of our transformation of the level and our work now with the National Park to restore and enhance the historic Stanmer Park. But above all, um, in its umbrella sense, I'm proud of our wider partnership work that has led to the international recognition of our very special environment as a UN Biosphere Reserve. Out of the limelight, officers from all our service areas have been making great strides on a daily basis and doing so despite the financial challenges we face. For example, our environmental health officers continue to support improving food safety standards in our restaurants, and I think year on year we have seen improvement there thanks to their great work. And our sustainability team who have supported the mainstreaming of One Planet Living and the implementation of the citywide sustainability action plan. So they're just two examples of many, many activities within the uh, areas of, of the, our brief covers. And I would like to um, lead the way in thanking all our officers for their skill and dedication and for delivering so many proud achievements. And I would like to lead our thanks of all our partner organisations, communities and individual residents for offering us their views, support as well as challenge along the, along the way. And finally, I would like to pay tribute to the contribution and support of fellow members from all three political parties who, despite our differences at time, have most often found agreement on what we may do best for the city. We know some members of the committee are standing down from the council in May, so in particular, I would like to thank them for their great contribution and wish them well in the future. And while not particularly wishing to single out any one member, I think we should recognize the exceptional contribution of Councillor Ian Davey taking transport to another level in this city. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> yeah. and, to, and to all of us who might be returning, there is, of course, plenty more to do for the city, and I'm very much looking forward to uh, the opportunity of working together with you and with new colleagues again in May. So thank you very much. Okay, back to uh, our business. Uh, item 87 is our call over. And um, John, if you would conduct the call over, please. I'll just go through the agenda. If members could indicate which items they would like to call and those um, not. Uh, item 89, consideration of options for Marlock Recreation Grounds. 90, Health and Safety Service Plan 2015-16. Item 91, Official Feed and Food Control Service Plan 2015-16. Uh, item 92, Brighton Sea Cadets Volunteer Permits. 92. Item 93, Highway Asset Management Strategy. Item 94, Sound and Five Bays Resident Parking Scheme Consultation. Um, 94. Item 95, Valley Gardens. And item 96, 20 mile an hour, phase three speed limit orders. Shh. I don't want to call it. They're not calling it. They're not calling it. We don't want to call it. You can take it back. Hmm? You can take it back, Chris. I, will, I mean, that's fair enough if Chris wants to. Um, we're going to bring it, yeah, we've agreed we'll bring it up the agenda anyway, so can, that's okay. Could, could we just let him say something now? Yeah, we could do, because otherwise he's, Emma's going to have to wait all the way through the public participation. Um, I'm agreeable to that. Chris, would you like to say something in advance? Because we're... Welcome the fact that this is going through and um, the fact that there's only been one objection and that most areas are proceeding... Fine. I've had to explain to residents, you know, the rigmarole, the necessary de democracy of the way this chunders forward. And um, so I'm just very glad we've now reached this stage and full steam ahead with everything that depends upon it, um, because it's not only the 20 miles an hour, but other measures can now be brought in that it, it has to be 20 miles an hour before they safety measures and so forth can be implemented. So I'm delighted about this and okay. um, onwards. And I can talk about okay. council with Thank you. Councillor Wheels later. 
I think the residents have shown how content they are with the proposals in their response to the TRO consultation. So thank you very much. Okay, so we've not pulled that in. Just to recap, uh, those reserved for discussion is item 89, item 92, item 94, and item 95. And those reports received and agreed are item 90, 91, 93, and 96. Okay, um, our first item of um, public involvement, um, which is item 88 on page 27 of your agenda, we have a uh, petition um, regarding pound display fees at five ways. Uh, Claire Letton, if you'd like to come forward, please. And you have up to three minutes to summarize your petition and indicate the number of uh, signatures. Okay, um, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I'm here really to uh, put forward um, our case on behalf of the Five Ways Traders Association. Um, so, um, shall I begin? <laughs> Um, so I don't know if you know Five Ways at all, it's a very vibrant area. We've got a nice little community with a range of independent and diverse businesses there. Um, while some of our customers do come from further afield and they are making that journey specifically and they're prepared to pay, a lot of our custom actually comes from people who live within the area. Um, a lot of people do choose to use their cars for a number of reasons. Um, Preston Drove being on the edge of the pay and display zone J does cause some problems because that means over half of our customers are unable to use the pay and display base for free as they could if they had a, a, a Zone J permit. We would like our customers to be able to come back and use the businesses repeatedly, you know, day after day after day, as many of them do. But for those who are now living north of Preston Drove and aren't included in Zone J, it means that we're effectively asking them to add an extra four or five pounds onto their bill every week. Um, Customers tell us that they really resent spending a pound when they come to pay and post a parcel and pick up their prescription or when they come to buy a birthday present and errands that maybe take them between five and ten minutes. They would like to be able to have a, a, a certain grace period, whether that's 13 minutes or 15 minutes, to allow them to, to come and shop and use the businesses for free. Now, my concern is that customers tell us that they're shopping less and less in five ways, and we are bounded on all sides, north, south, east, and west, by superstores. So to the north, you've got uh, the Asda Superstore and the retail parks up there with free parking. You've got to the south, you've got um, other supermarkets. You've got the Sainsbury Supermarket, which provides two hours free parking, so customers can park there and use the businesses in, in the areas around there. At the bottom of Preston Drove, which is really of more of concern to us, we have a Sainsbury's local with free parking, and they have just opened up a, a, a chain, it's a chain pet store. Um, now, they can provide free parking, but they are in direct competition with another of our Five Ways business owners who has her own pet shop on Preston Drove less than a minute's drive away. Now, they can offer as a chain store free parking, and she can't. Um, and that, that really is a concern, because it could, be, it could be the breaking of her business. You know, we have all of us noticed that we have had a, a, a downturn in trade and we call it the um, while I'm here business so people will park up and go do you know what while I'm here I'll just get a loaf of bread and I'll just pop in and see if they've got something for Johnny's birthday or you know that kind of thing so we think it's really important that our small businesses survive that customers have the opportunity to come in to chat to have conversations and build friendships because that what that's what keeps a community strong and healthy our businesses are run by people who live there whose children go to school whose families have grown up there you know we're passionate about our vibrant little community and we'd like to just level the playing field now we understand that there's been precedent set in Matlock Road and that's been um, beneficial for both customers and for um, business owners as well and we'd like you to consider allowing our customers a grace period so that we can level that field and our customers can come and go quickly and easily and support all of us local business owners and we in turn then support our community as well. One second. <laughs> Thank okay. you. That was exact. Do, you, do you want to wait and hear the response? Thank you. Um, can you remind me how many signatures it was again? I believe it was um, over 1,100, 1,170 something. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, I've, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my response. Um, paid parking for visitors is a well-established principle within the parking policy across the city, 
and the recent changes have increased the availability of parking for visitors to the businesses in Preston Drove. The Council does have concerns regarding the enforcement of limited waiting free bays and although we, are, we have introduced introduce free parking in two specific locations in outer areas, the current policy agreed at a recent committee meeting stated that parking schemes within and just outside the central zone would not be considered for free parking due to the demand for parking. The Area J parking scheme is adjacent to the central park Brighton parking schemes, so a change to free parking in this zone would be a change in the current agreed policy. Committee will recall, as you mentioned, that we developed the policy on free parking periods in response to similar concerns raised in regard of Matlock Road, which is in a zone not adjacent to central Brighton zones. It is third layer of zones. However, given that this location is um, at the very outer edge of Zone J, and we have the possibility of a new zone coming into the north of here, which would be on, literally on the other side of the road, um, and that the policy may be um, very applicable for locations like Preston Circus within Zone J, um, it may not be quite as appropriate in an extreme location like this. So I will ask officers to show flexibility in considering your request. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The committee agree to note the petition? Thank you. Okay, okay our second petition, um, Simon Conroy regarding Hollingbury Park Avenue, Hollingbury Terrace. Hello. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm here today to present our petition to have Hollingbury Park Avenue and Hollingbury Terrace included in the Surrenden and Five Ways south of, uh, sorry, west of Ditchin Road proposed parking consultation. I'm here because we want to be consulted. Exclusion would have a significant impact on our two streets. 87% of the households in Hollingbury Park Avenue and Hollingbury Terrace supported our petition and signed it. We want to be consulted. Local shops and surrounding residents support this also and have signed accordingly. In total, we received 217 signatures. Our three local councillors have all confirmed their support in writing. If we're not included in the consultation process, our two streets, which are already under severe parking pressure, will be the only roads north of five ways free of parking control. Commuters already use the streets for free parking and get the bus into town. Existing parking zone residents leave second cars, camper vans and company vehicles for long periods of time to avoid permit costs. After late afternoon, it's hard to park anywhere near our own homes. As well as double parking to unload groceries, we also have to double park to unload children. Increasingly, we have to walk long distances in the dark from where we're able to park to our homes. The current one-way traffic controls and steep hill to the east of Hollingbury Park Avenue and Hollingbury Terrace mean that our two streets would become a parking ghetto if the zone was extended without us. For the sake of the quality and safety of our family lives, our fair access to our properties and the adequacy of our on-street parking facilities, we request that we're given the opportunity to be consulted. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your petition. Um, officers have looked at uh, your request um, uh, and they are recommending including Hollingbury Park Avenue and Hollingbury Terrace into the proposed scheme as it creates a natural boundary uh, and connects to the current consultation area. Um, after reviewing the consultation proposals, including looking at these specific streets, I feel it would be appropriate and following um, Ward Council support as well that we do actually incorporate 
these two roads into the proposed uh, new area. Um, unfortunately, um, despite having looked at the draft uh, uh, um, report previously and requested that the roads would be in, put into the area, the map before us today on the agenda hasn't picked that up. So we will need to, I will be proposing an amendment to the recommendations to the report when we take it later on, and that's why I called the report, because otherwise we would have ended up leaving you out, which is not what we want to do. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, sorry, yes. Does the committee agree to note the petition? Thank you. Our third petition uh, is regarding Hollingbury Road. Um, Edward Start. Ah, oh, Ed. Please come forward. Thank you. I have passed a, a paper petition to Mr. Peel at the beginning of the meeting. Um, so you've got three minutes to summarise your petition yes. request and outline how many signatures as okay. well, please. Uh, the residents of Hollandbury Road are presenting two petitions with a total of 142 of the road's respondents to Brighton Road Council to include Hollandbury Road in the proposed Five Ways and Sarandon Resident Parking Scheme consultation. Hollingbury Road leads directly off the five ways and is currently adversely affected by overspill parking from controlled parking zone J, as well as by other road users who wish to have access to unrestricted and free parking. The extension of zone J north of five ways would result in an increase in parking demands on Hollingbury Road, which is already at full capacity and is placing residents under intolerable and unacceptable pressure. Hollandby Road is used for car parking by some residents of existing zones who use the road for parking second cars or trade vehicles. Parking by staff from Brighton Council's Hollandean Depot and nearby industrial and commercial sites adds significantly to the parking problems in Hollandby Road. Hollandby Road, if excluded from a Zone J extension, will become the free parking area of choice for Five Ways shoppers and customers of the Five Ways public house and restaurants. This will put even greater parking pressure on the road. Holmery Road is the nearest free parking road in this area to the controlled zones that are closer to the city centre and is therefore used as a convenient all-day car park for visitors or those working in the city. Holmbury Road has a large number of dwellings in multiple occupation, thus there's a requirement for the maximum parking capacity for the road's residents, and this can only be achieved by controlled managed parking. Holmbury Road has a real and genuine need for a resolution of its parking and traffic related problems that significantly and adversely affect the quality of life and the environment of its residents. In submitting this petition, it's recognised that if Hollingbury Road is included in an extended Zone J, there will be an impact on other residential roads in Lower Hollingdean. We urge Brighton Council and Hove Council sorry, to consider widening the scope of the consultation to the Lower Hollingdean roads. Thanks. Thank you very, very much for your petition. Um, I do very much appreciate the pressures that you and so many other residents um, experience with from parking, especially when you're on the edge of existing parking zones. So um, the, the I think one thing um, important to mention is that the proposals before us um, for the area north of uh, Preston Drove, uh, including, uh, as you know now, the um, Hollingby Park Avenue and Hollingby Dean Terrace, Hollingbury Terrace has, has just been discussed. It, the proposal is for actually for a new area. It wouldn't be for an extension of Zone J. So the technical officers have looked at your request for Hollingbury Road uh, and it doesn't connect with the area that's to be consulted upon. Um, and therefore it would need to be considered as part of another area when um, when the future parking scheme timetable is considered later this year. 
So I think, first of all, you know, as long as, to appreciate that we're, we're not looking to extend Zone J. If, if that were the case, then I, I could perhaps see the logic of including um, Hollingby Road, but it, it doesn't, as it would be a separate area uh, to Zone J, it, it certainly it would be a finger off of that, and it doesn't, it doesn't logically uh, sit with the, the new proposed area. But that can be looked at again. Okay. I, pre I appreciate can, your disappointment. Can I say something? Uh, briefly, but uh, yes. Uh, Zone J begins at the five ways in Ditchling Road. And Adam? Zone J begins at the five ways in Ditchling Road. It goes up Ditchling Road to, to five, five ways, ways and then down and Holland Holland Road, 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 Grove, yes. connects with Ditchling Road at the five ways. That's right, but the proposed consultation area for the new zone would be to the north of Preston Drove and uh, would also pick up Hollingbury Park Avenue and Terrace, whereas Hollingbury Road is actually to the east and south of that proposed area and doesn't connect in a logical way to that area. We have a map before us later on. But thank you very much for coming. Your, no, your position is noted. Um, you know, it will be obviously uh, taken into consideration when further proposals come forward. So thank you. Uh, our committee happy to note that petition. Thank you. Um, our fourth petition is regarding George Street in Hove. Councillor Wheels. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've been asked to present um, a petition by um, a business in George Street in my uh, in our um, ward, um, because he can't be here today. Um, and this petition concerns the hours in which George Street, Street is closed to traffic. Um, currently, uh, George Street is closed to traffic uh, between 10 a.m. and 4 o'clock in winter and uh, 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. in uh, summertime. And um, I have a petition with, nine, with, I know that we said 55, but it's gone up to 90 signatures now, 91 signatures of businesses to um, es essentially um, have the closure hours to traffic just between 10 and 4 um, during the summertime, so open to traffic a little bit earlier in the summer. Um, the, um, they've done a lot of work, actually. They, they, the um, 91 petitioners are all individual businesses in the street. Um, and uh, when I sent the original draft, the, the, first, the beginning of the petition to um, Mark Pryor, um, one of the concerns was the, the position of the people that actually signed the, the, the um, petition. But in fact, actually, I actually have the um, job descriptions of every single petitioner and you'll see that there are 47 managers of the shops there, um, 33 owners, and the rest are, um, are, are, are deputy managers. So it's essentially decision makers in all of those businesses have signed. So in fact, actually, um, I have to say it's quite a, um, a much greater display of uh, a consensus of opinion around opening hours in George Street than I would ever have dreamed to have seen. Um, they've also done a bit of work... <coughs> <laughs> They're so organised. And this is... Uh, sorry, I'll share this with the uh, committee afterwards, but essentially it's every business in the street um, that, that has signed this petition. So you'll see um, the, the reds on there are the businesses which have either had a manager, an owner, or a deputy manager that signed this. So um, it's quite a substantial um, consensus, which, as I've said, given the controversies that opening hours in Georgia have brought in the past, I must admit that surprised me. But um, we have to take this at face value, I believe, and the, the, the signatures state that there is a consensus. So um, I was asked by uh, Mr Saunders, who asked me to bring this today, to uh, ask for this to be expedited as quickly as possible. So uh, thank you for listening. Well, you've presented me with a dilemma, Councillor, because... I have it recorded here that 55 people have signed the petition. And on that basis, the advice I have is that you haven't actually got a majority of traders. Um, but if your map's anything to go by, it would look like you have got a majority. Is that what you're saying? I think we've got a clear majority because also, of course, some of the shops are vacant. So there are actually 88 occupied units. And the other thing is, of course, that if you're working on a majority and you work out that there's 104, I think, you were talking about, some of them are duplicate or triplicate. So, for example, Boots is actually four shops. 
uh, take some four shops. So, um, okay. yeah, I mean, I, all I can do is, you know, when you asked me a couple of weeks ago how many signatures were and how many, the estimate, I asked the petitioner how many they thought they would get. That was the answer I got from them. When I picked up the petition on Saturday, this is what I'm bringing to you um, as their representative. So, okay. And I'm so sorry, if, you, if your preparation hasn't been quite adequate. But it, the but they, I guess the challenge is to respond to, to, to what the, the, the petition actually is that, the, Thank you. Where's, is that where the figure of 55 came from? It was their estimate of what they thought they were it is a, Yes, they said between 50 and 60. But they've actually so. exceeded that. Yeah. Yes, I just want to take uh, 91 is greater than 55. That's true. Thank you. Excuse me, Chair. Um, it's just been suggested to me if you wish to, do, to defer it to come up with something, then that's possible, but if you can come up with something now as a result, that's helpful as well. Thanks. Okay. Um. Well, I've, 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 got, I've got a response here, which includes making the point that um, in the past, um, this, this matter has been, of timings has been considered before uh, through a public inquiry. And also, um, and then there wasn't a majority in favour. And also, uh, there was also a decision taken uh, by the Environment Cabinet mem member meeting in 2011, which is much the same sort of conclusion from what I can understand. And so on the basis that you hadn't actually produced any uh, fresh evidence that was showing a majority, I wasn't proposing that we take this any further. But as you have, I would actually like officers to look at this further again. Um, and I've just consulted the Head of Transport who's happy to do so. So um, I think if members are happy to agree the to note the petition, but we will ask officers to look at this a bit further and consider what you have actually got there. Um, it would have been okay. a report back to the next meeting. Um, yeah, we can certainly have a report back to the next meeting on that. You can have a question. Oh, we've got two points. Go on, then. I, I can well understand that this is what the shopkeepers and so forth have um, said, but what that... Um, so far, and naturally I assume that whatever the council officers do, it will also be very important to ask residents and um, people who visit the area what they mm -hmm. think, because they are the people that generate the income for the traders, and I, I know a lot of the changing nature of George Street and so forth, as it is in Church Road and elsewhere, um, many, many roads, uh, Boundary Road, Richardson Road, the growth of cafes and so forth. Um, people like to sit outside a cafe, especially in the summer months, which is the reason we have this dual hour system. That's why it was brought in in the first place. And I, I think people I talk with sitting outside Cafe Revival and all these cafes, one of the attractions of it is because they haven't got cars coming past as they mm. do on a Sunday, which is pretty blighted, I think, on a Sunday. And then there's fewer people visit on a Sunday. I, it's my, uh, yeah. So uh, uh, I think we need to take the residents and okay, customers. Thank, thank you, Councillor. I'm account. sure officers will consider the residents' point of view as well as traders' point of view. Councillor Davey. I just can't help thinking we're going around in circles on this, really, because, as I recall, at the end of the, the last administration in 2011, exactly the same thing occurred. And then when we came into administration, I was presented with exactly the same situation, and, and, and the, res, the, the, the traders were asked, and there was clearly, you know, the consultation was carried out, and there was clearly no, no preference for it. And so, yeah, I just kind of think we're going around in circles with this. About, I'm sure we will continue to do so, and it's probably gone a long time. We'll probably go on way beyond my interest in this well, can I suggest I've, that you have a report yes. to the next meeting? Yeah, we, I, I think we'll have a report to the next meeting about um, officers' considerations and, the, and, and, and if they have any proposed next steps to that. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. We're a committee happy to note the petition. Thank you. Okay, right, moving on. 
Um, we have written questions from members of the public. Um, our first, can we, yeah, one meeting, please. Um, page 29, um, Refuse Collection in Regency Ward. Catherine Wilson, uh, would you like to come forward and present your question, please? Um, our rubbish and recycling bins in Regency are often overflowing and surrounded by fly-tipped items like mattresses and rubble. <clears throat> to minimise health and safety issues and avoid the need to walk around the ward trying to find a bin which is not overflowing or surrounded with rubbish, can bins have a sticker with a bin number and a free phone number for residents to ring or text? when they are full or when fly tipping has occurred. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for your question um, regarding communal re uh, refuse and recycling bins. Um, these bins should not be overflowing and in instances where they do, officers are looking to resolve these issues. Uh, in your area, officers are in touch with representatives of the Clifton Montpellier Powys uh, Community Alliance and are organising meetings to look at any improvements that can be made to address issues with bins overflowing and I know that ward councillors have been involved with this as well. Unfortunately some people do fly tip bulky items next to communal uh, bins rather than taking them to the tip or arranging for their collection. Um, where we can we follow up uh, on this and our street crews collect the items when they see them uh, or when they are reported to the service. In the coming year, we will be able to start a program of refurbishment of communal bins, and as part of that, we will look to improve signage on the bins, advising residents uh, what can and cannot be disposed of in the bins, and encouraging people to recycle as much as possible. We will also include clear contact details for people to report any problems, and officers are looking at an asset management system as part of this work. So I completely agree, we do need more information for people uh, at the bins and um, I'm hoping that when we provide that, uh, we will see a, a change of behaviour because people shouldn't be doing, doing this. <coughs> I completely agree with you. No, there's no opportunity for members to engage in debate and ask questions, no, I'm afraid not. Um, the questioner has an opportunity to ask a supplementary question. Councillors, please. Excuse me. One meeting. Would you like to uh, ask supplementary? Well, I mean, my only question was going to be in the time scale then. So what sort of time scale would we be talking about? In, um, I'm, not, to I'm not entirely sure when they will get cracking with the, um, with the renewal, with the refurbishment. It will be a rolling program, but it is to start this year. So um, I think where the... Um, where the first emphasis goes is a matter of officers deciding and probably negotiating with communities as to what is most necessary. Um, I'm sure they're already in contact with your community and you're flagging up your particular problems, so I would imagine you'd be a fairly high priority. So thank you very much. Thank you. Especially as I raised this about a year ago. Hmm? Sorry? I raised this issue of the bins in this area about a year ago, so I'm pleased something's going to Well, we're, we're getting down to it, Geoffrey. It's always a matter of having enough money, and um, not having the council tax put up uh, more than a certain amount is always a difficulty. Yes, quite. So, our, our next written question is regarding grip bins in Regency Ward. Um, Sarah Cooper. <coughs> Thank you. Not very seasonal at the moment, but um, I know of neighbours in Regency who have slipped and injured themselves in icy weather in Victoria Street particularly, and cars have crashed into other parked cars on the corner of Clifton Place and Terrace. Can we please have more grip bins, and can all of them be regularly filled during icy and snowy conditions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, the total number of bins, um, grip bins, in Brighton & Hove uh, that we now maintain is 420. Uh, compared with other authorities, this is actually a high quantity within what is a relatively small geographical area. 
This is because we recognise that Brighton and Hove is mainly urban area built on hills. However, provision of grip bins needs to be balanced against the capability to refill, refill them within a reasonable time scale, as well as the availability of resources. It takes two weeks for supply trucks to visit and fill all the bins. Due to budget constraints following the, the 2012 budget setting process, grip bins will only be filled once at the start of the winter season unless there is a heavy snowfall. This means that even if a grip bin is empty immediately after being filled, then there will be no further refilling except during severe weather. <coughs> this was agreed at full budget council by, by the whole of council and ratified as part of the 2012-13 Highways Winter Service Plan at the Transport Committee in 2012 and we annually renew that plan and it comes before this committee and members agree to that. Regency Ward borders um, the sea and is therefore warmer than some of the outlying areas. It does not receive the same snowfall as more hilly outlying areas and what, and what snow does fall tends to melt sooner. The area does not meet the council's agreed criteria for the provision of grip beans, which aims to supply provision for colder areas with steep, steep hills and junctions. The surrounding roads of Montpelier Road, Western Road and Dyke Road are on gritted routes and there is a grip bin at the junction of Dyke Road and Clifton Terrace. This is not as thorough a provision as we might wish but unfortunately it is the best that we can offer within the constraints which I have explained. Thank you. Okay. Have you a supplementary question? No. Um, it's interesting we're not as, as cold as other areas. It's not the obsession, but I'm sure there are data to support that. Well, okay. I, sh yeah, it's exactly. The, the, the hillier outlying areas do actually get much more s severe um, snow when it, when it snows than the city centre areas close to the sea. That is true as Councillor Theobald knows because he represents Patchum and Hollingbury Ward. Um, and, and as I say, we have a very, very detailed winter service plan that all members agree to annually and are actually always very praiseworthy of the provisions that it makes. So I think we have over the years uh, from the more recent times of snow events learnt by experience and honed that plan very well. So I think members are comfortable that we're providing all we can within resources. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, our next item, item 88 on page 31, is deputations uh, from members of the public. And we have a deputation regarding St Andrew's Road, South Port Slade, Patricia Sawyer, are you here to um, make that? Would you like to come forward, please? I do remember meeting you when I came to visit before, yes. Very rainy day. It was. <laughs> um, you've got five minutes to um, put your deputation. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, councillors. Thank you for letting me come here today, together with the other noisy residents of St Andrews Road, to tell you about the problems we're experiencing in the real hope that you'll be able to help us alleviate some of them. I'm here because my family and grandchildren live on the road and I'm appalled at the traffic conditions. Some residents have made individual complaints previously, but they have not been heard and there's been no avail. St Andrews is a modest road in Southport Slade about half a mile long, running between Church Road and Boundary Road in parallel with the seafront, allowing two-way traffic and with cars parked on both sides. It's almost entirely residential and made up of just over 100 Victorian houses. Some have elderly, long-standing residents and there's an increasing number of young families. What's important, as you know, Mr. Chairman, if you've walked along it with me, it's a very narrow road. It's only 24 feet or eight meters of roadway wide. And that's from about here to the red chairs. Yet it has to accommodate and endure huge amounts of traffic. And this is what's causing the problem. On the advice of your road safety team, we carried out a resident survey last October 
Nearly half the households responded, and most of them expressed real concern about the traffic volume, type, and speed. Traffic has taken priority here, and we feel it's time that the City Council looks to the safety and well-being of residents by working with us to reduce it. I'll tell you about some of the issues. Huge HGVs and vans use the road as a shortcut, throughout the night even, vibrating and shaking houses and creating lots of noise. Cars rat run through to avoid two sets of traffic lights on the main roads. Buses still travel both ways, causing huge congestion, pollution and nuisance. Now the local bus service is admirable in its frequency, but in reality this means that over 150 buses each weekday from 6 in the morning to just past midnight, pass along the narrow road, sometimes in convoy, many almost empty. Eastbound buses do not even stop along the road. Now, the average car is six foot wide, so with cars parked on both sides, there's only 12 foot of roadway space, making it almost impossible for moving vehicles to pass each other, especially if one of them is a bus or a lorry. Massive congestion and jams occur nearly every day. You've got the photos of some of the incidents. And when this happens, the vehicle engines idle. They pump out toxic fumes into the narrow canyon that is the road. And this is even the case for the buses that run on blue diesel. The constant acceleration and braking of stop and go erratic traffic burns more gas, creates brake and tire debris, and puts poisonous pollutants into the air. And as you know, this is particularly harmful for the young children and the elderly. There's also noise nuisance from the traffic going fast over the humps. There doesn't seem to be any enforcement of speed limits. There are frequent minor traffic accidents and considerable damage to residents' cars. The destruction of the road service and possible damage to property some of the roadway was repaired last year and is already breaking up again. But most of all, our concern is about health and safety. St Andrews is a main route for children to walk to local schools, and we want them to walk. But it's far too dangerous for young ones to use unaccompanied. They certainly couldn't play in the street. And the vehicle pollutants hang around at low child level. The road contains busy gateway for Vale Park and Traffic often pulls in there to avoid the jams. There's hardly a cyclist to be seen on St. Andrew's Road, except on the pavements. That's because they'd be squashed if they were on the roadway. Your stated and commendable aim is to make Brighton, Hove and Port Slade a city fit for people. Last year, when the roadworks were on, we, it gave us a snapshot of what was possible when the traffic was rerouted elsewhere. So we ask you now, with some urgency, to plan ways of reducing the traffic flow and dominance of vehicles on St. Andrew's Road. We don't expect a bypass, but some cost-effective measures, which must include consultation with the bus commissioners, to make the street fit, safe and pleasant for the community of people that live along it. One minute. <laughs> well, thank you, Patricia. Um, and I'm sure a committee will agree with me in thanking you um, and the residents of St. Andrew's Road for presenting your case, um, and particularly having gathered quite so many views of people. It, it is impressive, and um, we're grateful for that. Uh, and I know that, um, that you've been working with the road safety team. I'm sure that's been of help to you. Um, as residents and members will be aware, St. Andrew's Road is both residential uh, road, but it, um, providing access to residential areas to the north and the south, but as well as forming a direct and convenient link between Boundary Road and Church Road, as you've described. Uh, the route is therefore attractive to a wide range of users, including those uh, that you've, you've mentioned, uh, and it includes bus routes. Um, and yes, I did experience St Andrews Road and the and the uh, additional roads on the way to the school when we, we walked the route that time 
uh, I guess it was last year, I can't yeah, remember it where it was, something like that, yes. So uh, I did get some direct experience then. Um, and your, your photographs are certainly very helpful in showing the sort of problems. Um, the, the traffic and environmental issues that the road has faced for many years, uh, as you've described, uh, are certainly recognised um, by committee and local councillors, and many of them have been treated by the introduction of speed cushions, uh, curb build-outs, and entry treatments on, on a number of the, the junctions, all of which have contributed to um, a good safety record. Uh, and there has only been one injury collision recorded in the streets since 2010. Um, the, the use of the route by heavy goods vehicles and buses is difficult to restrict without limiting access to public transport and the convenience of deliveries. Um, but I will certainly ask officers to continue their supportive engagement with residents, yourself included, to try to find solutions um, that will go some way to alleviating the impacts of these activities on, on your residential street. So thank you very much. Um, yes, um, yes you can, Chris. No, you put your mic on. It gets certainly a bit quieter in the evenings. Um, but um, what well, was interesting, you mentioned the roadworks last year. So can you tell us what, during the roadworks, what route the bus took at that time? That could be a useful way of sorting out at least part of this problem. Where, where did the buses go rather than along? It's a very attractive street. It's beautiful architecture, I think. The, the, um, the tops of the buildings well worth looking up at as well. But that's by the by. It's a very nice, essentially residential road, which over the years has built up the situation you eloquently describe. I'd just like to know where the buses could be rerouted to, as we have done. Can I? Alan. I mean, I, I, I can answer that for you, and I can also perhaps go on to what I was going to say. It, it, the buses were rerouted along the seafront. They were taken down Boundary Road uh, and turned right along the seafront, back right up Church Road. Now, the reason the buses say they can't make that manoeuvre permanently is the right-hand turns are difficult to make and cause a build-up in traffic. Um, so that is why they say they can't do that permanently. But, I, I mean, I've sat with Patricia for many hours and we've, we've, um, we've run through this. And, it, and I think what she's saying is quite right. It's not saying that there's any necessarily any brilliant answers or that the, the residents have got any brilliant answers, but they just want it recognised and want people to work with them to see if there's any little bits. I mean, I was talking to a lady just before we started who, who for no reason overnight had a bus stop spring up outside her house. Uh, directly outside our front bedroom window. Um, and mm -hmm. that we've asked that be moved down further, but are told it can't be because then everybody on top of the bus would be looking into someone else's bathroom window. So the, 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 the problems are there and they are recognised. And I think all the residents are saying it's not, you know, do this or do that or we want a load of money spent here or anything. They just want people to recognise it and come up with perhaps smaller um, answers to, that will, will make life more pleasant for them and, and you, you know I think they've, they've, they've got a jolly good point here and I do appreciate the bus's point that they the, the right hand turns but you wonder if something I mean I've been down there when you have a convoy four or five buses one after the other clogging completely clogging up the road and uh, you know I, so so I, I fully support what Patricia says that you, you know they do need a bit of help okay. to, 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 to okay. sort these things Thank, thank you, Councillor. I think that was a helpful addition there. Of course, the bus companies do actually pick their own routes. It's, yeah. Um, um, sorry, but I think you can your, consult with the bus commission, commissioners you've raised on this. the profile of this issue very well, Patricia, but if you've got something else to add, I don't mind, but we, we will need to move on in a moment. I just wanted to say that the bus commissioners can be consulted on this. Say that again, I didn't quite... The bus know. commissioners can be consulted about this. They're not completely a law unto themselves. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for coming today. Um, are members happy to note... Yes, indeed. Are, are members happy to note the deputation? Thank you. Okay. Um, that concludes our public participation and um, we move on to the reports before committee. Um, 
Remind me, John, before I make a mistake, which one we've got to take. Right, we're taking Marlowe. So, item 89 first, and um, Jan, you will introduce the report, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> this report stems from a, a petition that was submitted by Morag Marlowe Recreation Group, um, Marlowe Recreation Ground Action Group. Uh, the petition was presented to full council in October of last year and was uh, calling for improvements to the play area uh, at Mile Oak. The petition was referred to this committee in November and it was resolved that officers would look into the situation and produce a report to bring back to committee. Um, officers have looked into, into the situation and um, Mile Oak Recreation Ground is, is a, a site that is really valued by the local community. Um, it is one of 45 play areas in the city and uh, back in 2009 it received £70,000 worth of play builder money uh, for improvements. The, um, one of the, the points raised by the petition was that other, other areas appear to have a lot more for their money and um, one of the issues at my local was that a lot of the equipment was at the end of its life so the money had to basically be used to remove the equipment and start with the blank canvas. It wasn't used to build onto an existing play area. And there also wasn't any Section 106 money available. Some other areas had Section 106 money available. Um, we received £1.1 million worth of play builder funding in 2009. Our only other main source of capital funding is Section 106 funding for the improvements of playgrounds. And to give you an idea um, of the, the level of investment required, uh, to, to refurbish a playground, you're, you're looking for anything from, from £60,000 to £150,000 plus. So, you know, it is, it is costly. Um, we have a maintenance budget for play areas of £156,000, and we've recently done a, a survey, which we do annually, of the maintenance that's required. And our, our current outstanding maintenance program is, is just over £200,000. So all our uh, maintenance budget is currently going to the, the reactive maintenance of, of play areas. Um, clearly, the, we, we had an uh, injection of investment with Play Builder, um, but those sites are starting to age now and, and the, um, the maintenance burden will increase in future years. Last year, we, uh, this committee approved that we would work on an open spaces strategy, which we are doing now. And um, later on this year, we will be able to uh, present this committee with recommendations uh, for playground uh, maintenance going into the future, taking into account the, the financial challenge that, that we have. Um, playgrounds are very important and communities feel very passionate about them. And we often get requests for improvements to play areas from local community groups, from residents, from councillors. Um, recent ones include uh, Hove Lagoon, Manor Road and Hangleton Park. So there are also lots of other communities in the city saying, please, please can you help us improve our play areas. Um, our rangers and parks operations team is, is working with Morag to do what they can and they've agreed to do some landscape improvements um, and some funding has been found by Morag I think from the Healthy Neighbourhood grant and that's going to be used to install a, a wild gym uh, fitness equipment in the area. Um, so in conclusion we don't, we don't have the capital um, to, to carry out as uh, larger scale improvements at the site, but officers will work with the group and with other members of the community to pursue, um, to support them in pursuing other sources of funding. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. It's clearly a very financially challenging position to support all our parks across the city, um, but I'm very glad that you've been able to find a way of helping them lever in some external funding. Chris, you have a question. Uh, I, I, Alan, was yours a question or a point? Right. Well, yeah. we'll let Chris go first. Yes, I've got a comment a as well. But just a question. One of the things I enjoyed, I think it was last year, the time blurs in this experience, um, is Wish Park on the um, western side. There's those so-called Wish Hills, which were brought in along with wildflowers and so forth. I went to the opening of that with the residents, and that was very enjoyable, north of the allotment that's been created there. Um, and I believe that got some completely different funding for that. I wonder if Jan can remind me where that money came from and 
Um, I might be barking up a wrong something or other, but um, it just occurred to me, and I wonder if there are, it's not for me to do the work, but um, are there other sources of funding? It's just occurred to me, as I say, remembering the, the, which I commend everyone to go and look at, a very nice spot in Wish Park stroke Aldrington Recreation Ground, depending on what mood you're in. Right. So are there other sources of funding that might be of use? Um, like I say, the, the main funding that we have for play areas tends to be Section 106 funding. Um, we, we look for grant funding where we can. I think you're referring to, are you referring to bee banks planted with wildflowers? Yes. Yeah, and, and we are looking to do that at Mile Oak as well. Um, and we, again, we had a, a nature improvement area funding for that. Um, so, so yes, but, but I think the important thing is, you know, the, the level of investment required for a playground, you, you're looking £60,000 plus, so they are quite significant, significant sums of money. There's also an officer capacity to be able to actually draw up changes as well, getting the money, depending on whether it pays you to do the work as well as pays the capital investment. Um, Alan, do you have a comment? No, I was just going to say, um, yes, I, I, naturally, it's everybody... Um, with, as you say, there's hundreds of such requests and everybody naturally is focused on their own. That's human nature. And it's one of the things you learn in a council is how, how many small things are going on and people and in, in the aggregate that becomes very expensive, of course. So naturally, very keen that this should happen in Mine Oak. Um, and also one of the things I've learned on the council is the surprising cost of things that might look simple. Oh, I'll do that for you, mate, type thing. And uh, it's more complicated than that. There's so many factors to take into account, as indeed the, I was very surprised at the cost of the, the so-called hills in Wish Park. So I hope people can sort of bear with us and realise that in these times and the unexpected costs of anything relatively simple, it's um, not as easy as it might look. But I'm all for this. I think it's great that people should be able to just let their minds um, be expanded along with going around on a, uh, whatever object it might be, a roundabout or so forth. Thanks. Thank you. Alan. <laughs> well, um, I, I, I think, I mean, I've, I've spoken to, um, we, we, did we all get the, 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 the email, the letter from Natalie, who's chair of MOREG, that um, yeah. was sent to all councillors. You, you wouldn't have done, Chris, because you're subbing for someone, but I think most everyone... And, and she makes the points in there far more eloquently than I can. I mean, it, I think the disappointment of this report is that it promises a lot, but actually says nothing. And, you know, to look at the five points that Natalie brings up there is who will work with us to complete these plans, who will help us complete these plans, who will help us complete the funding applications, uh, when will we see the plans and receive help, what exactly will the council do when they say support us? Will this be advisory? Or are they offering to part fund the work? What happens if we do raise funds? Who will do the work? Will the council match the money raised? And who will maintain the equipment in future? None of these questions are really answered there. Um, the wild gym that's going in, uh, which is, whereas it's appreciated by everybody, is, is really aimed at older children and adults. And the buff butterfly mound, as it is pointed out there, is, is, is a very nice feature and much appreciated again. But it's not something that the children can play on. So, it, it, you know, it, and when this come before council, it was the, the idea that the play equipment that put, was put in there was experimental and never really worked. But the people that, uh, who use the park are sort of stuck with that now. And nobody's willing to take ownership and say, well, we got it wrong. We're trying to do our best to put it right. It's still saying to the, the, the you know, to, to the, to, to the Morag people, if you're able to raise some money, we're quite happy for that. Well, of course you are. I mean, who wouldn't be? You know, it, 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 if, if somebody outside can raise money, then of course we're happy to, to, to come. But I think what they need to know is, where's the plan? What, where, where do they go for the funding? Who's going to help them raise the funding? And is there any, any ongoing funding for maintenance and, and upkeep? I think the point, Alan, as has been said and is clear in the report, is it's, there's very limited officer capacity. They will help as they can, but there are plenty of other areas that uh, need investment too. And uh, it's very good that some investment has been found, but we will be, you know, this, this is just taking the lid off it. We will have this open spaces strategy coming before committee later on. You can see the backlog of maintenance that we already need to pay just to keep the equipment going elsewhere. You know, it, you've got to be realistic. Um, Graham. Yeah. Um, 
I just want to make a couple of points because um, I, th I do think we need to be re realistic, but I also think we need to be a, a bit more in in inventive and innovative as well. Um, the fact is, um, whatever, whatever those of us who are or aren't standing for election in May might say, that the, the reality is that whoever ends up controlling this council um, after May and whoever ends up in government after May, there isn't going to be um, a significant more uh, a sum of money for, for this kind of thing. There's not going to be significant sums of public money. And whatever, whoever wins, whoever wins. And um, we, we, we therefore, I think, need to, to look at slightly different ways of doing this than just the traditional sort of coming to the council and, and asking for things and then complaining when the council doesn't, doesn't give them because we're, we're just not in that situation anymore. Um, I mean, I've just got a couple of thoughts that have occurred to me from having conversations with people. I'm sure others have got other ideas as well. Um, I, I was at PACA this morning, um, and I think some great things are happening at PACA. Um, that the, the, um, as, as well as tremendous facilities, I think there's some very good um, innovative education going on there, and um, it's particularly this focus on, on sport. I know that uh, in partnership with, um, with, with uh, the, the, the other school at Falmer, um, who, who it looks are going to have the cricket facilities, which means Packer will have the football facilities, and there's some um, you know, Wembley-style pitch going in there at the back. And they are really, really keen to work with, um, with Marlow Football Club, which, of course, adjoins the park, and with the, um, the, 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 the action group to improve the facilities at the park. I know that they've actually got a social action team amongst the pupils at Packer. I think there's 29 children involved with it under a very enthusiastic um, teacher. And there's actually a waiting list of children um, involved in that and one of the things you know they, they've already done and they're keen to do more of is, is, is work with the park um, improving it um, the, you, you mentioned the wild gym wild gyms if they're done correctly can be a really good idea but I think that offers potential for working with um, fitness clubs and um, personal trainers and that sort of thing whereby we perhaps generate money and, and, and so on and, 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 and collaborate with, the, with those sort of organizations and I mean, and I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't rule, rule out entering into some kind of formal agreement to transfer, um, you know, some responsibility for the whole part, whether to pack her in, 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 a, in a, some kind of community enterprise with the football club and with the, with the action group. I think it's that kind of thing we've got to be looking at rather than just kind of, um, you know, playing lip service to asking for money and then having the council reject it and so on. So that's my three pennies worth. I know none of that is easy. But that is the reality of the situation, and I think that's where we've got to be heading. Well, I think they're all helpful ideas, and I'm sure they can, you can help um, with the development of the open spaces strategy. Right, there's a bit of a queue forming, Emma. Thank you, Chair. And um, I think that some of the points made just now by Graham, could, or Councillor Cox, rather, sorry, um, could well have been picked up with staff time, which has been spent on values training. I'm neither against values nor training, but over £400,000 worth of staff time has been spent on values training in the last year alone. And I do think it's really annoying for um, parents who don't own a facility but want to do, you know, are putting time into making that facility better, to be told a vague thing about support and fundraising themselves. Now, some of those days of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of days of staff time could be used and should be used to support that group um, who have been left out of other, you know, um, where other, you, you mentioned Hove Lagoon. Well, they've got much better facilities than Marloke have. They may well want more, but they have got really good facilities. And so from my point of view, I would really like officers to take very seriously Councillor Robin's point about outlining and detailing the kind of support that Milo can expect. Okay, thank you. Lizzie. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, well, we do remember when we had the younger um, parents from Milo coming to this committee, and I do, um, I do understand their disappointment when they were, when they felt they'd been left out when the uh, play equipment was put in elsewhere. Um, I just want to make a few observations um, from perhaps personal observation, because I live very close to a children's park, which was very fortunate in getting quite a large tranche of money at the time. It's actually before I was a councillor, it's during the last administration, and um, we had in our local park the most amazing play builder equipment that was put in. But during the consultation, when the children themselves were asked, what would you like in your new park? To everybody's surprise, they said, please will you keep the swings? And that was a bit of a surprise because the swings, to put it mildly, needed a bit of a coat of paint. They'd been there for years and years and years. I mean, like, parents were sort of like pushing their children on these swings when they themselves had been pushed on those swings and grandparents, etc. So it did take um, people by surprise. Um, during the opening, which was by the mayor at the time, hundreds of children swarmed all over this fantastic play builder equipment. Now a few years on, I observed that it's actually the old swings which are equally as popular, if not maybe more so, than the amazing play builder equipment, which I understand has got a 10-year life. And there are so many of these put in in the city at the same time that it does concern me that in a few years' time, when we have so much less money to spend on maintenance and it's already stretched, quite how we will keep this play builder equipment going to the level it's as it was when it was first created. So I would urge officers when looking at the options for Maryland Park to really take long-term maintenance into consideration and just to say that things which are new and shiny and bright at the time don't always stand the test of time in the way that we might think. Yeah. Very good points. Thank you. Um, Geoffrey, did you indicate? Well, I was only going to say, and I think I said this at the last meeting or the one before, it, it, with Carbon Park in my own ward, a very enthusiastic group got together, um, and I think this is where councillors come in to be there as well, uh, helping, and put off lots of applications for grants and things, and, and succeeded. It succeeded very well indeed. So I, I think um, it, it, I know filling up forms and making grants and all that, is, is not an easy thing to do and it's very time consuming but uh, I think that is the way forward quite frankly mm. uh, in, in many cases so if Alan well Jeffrey well, speaking well, well Can you be quiet, I don't mind interrupt the answer to that one is that this very enthusiastic group got hold of ASDA and then made applications uh, I'm sure that Council could have could advise. There are groups. I think we sent off applications to um, some time ago now, so I can't even remember. But I know that we did achieve quite uh, a sizable sums of money, which went into that park, and uh, you can still see see that today. What, what a what a boost it is for for an area like Hollingbury. Okay. So that would be my suggestion. Yeah, helpful. We are beginning to fill up the time made available by not calling a lot of items, but uh, Jill. Thank you. This is only really, really brief. I think um, there is the will to do that, um, but what the community are asking for is some guidance from officers, from the experts, as to what they could reasonably expect to have in that children's playground. And therefore, they need a plan to be able to demonstrate to potential funders what they would like to see achieved. And I'm sure that Jan could arrange to, to meet with the group to say, okay, this is the sort of thing that you could um, hopefully see in the area um, with, uh, with, with, a, with a bit of, uh, of a push for external money. And then I think that would, that would help you along your way. Well, we, we don't have uh, a proposal for an implementation plan put before us. And I think what we need to do as a committee is wait until we've seen the full extent of the need for all our open spaces, and that will come with the open spaces strategy. And that would be the appropriate time to look to see what capacity there is to develop um, ongoing plans for all sorts of areas, because as Lizzie has pointed out, we've got play builder equipment in many places now that is coming to end of life. And we don't have the maintenance, all the officer capacity to do much about that. And if we start putting certain parks first, now I appreciate you know, the residents' concern in my life, but I think if officers had the capacity now to put a, put a master plan together 
they would be offering to do so. This is the difficulty we have with not having... Chair, I'm funds. not asking for a master plan. I'm asking for two swings, one slide, a roundabout, and maybe something else in the corner, and that will cost you 80000 Isn't that the kind of thing that you're looking for? That's all. That's not a master plan. That, that's just um, a starting point for f external fundraising. Well, there are ongoing conversations, so if officers can put that into the conversations, I'm sure that will be possible. I think the, the councillors in many ways should be leading this. Yeah. Um, and that's what's happened in my part of the world. I think councillors should be able to research and, uh, and, and find out the best things to do with some help with officers. That's, that would be my advice yeah. to any residents there. I think, I think that's, that's been very realistic and, and you know, you've, as you say, you've been very successful in your ward in doing that. So. Okay, I think we've actually had quite a good debate here. I think it's exposed some of the difficulties. I appreciate the, um, the concerns and the, the frustration of residents in, in, in Mile Oak, but also elsewhere, but we're just, you know, we need to hear from them as well. Um, officers are, will do what they can, um, and I certainly look forward to more detail um, later on uh, as to what position we're in and we can have a, have a further debate then. So we have recommendations before us um, to uh, note the um, work on the open spaces strategy and to note also the work that officers have already been doing with MORAG uh, and the improvements that are being installed at Mile Oak uh, and that um, the committee agrees that officers will support the local community in exploring sources of grant funding, which we have discussed. So I, I would commend those recommendations. I think this is a reasonable response to where we've arrived at with this particular debate about this particular part. I hope all members can support those recommendations. I'll put, I'll put those to the vote. Those in, I've, I've finished rambling. I'm going to ask you to vote on the recommendations if you're listening. So those in favour of the recommendations? Good. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. Right. What have we got next, John? 92. Sea Cadets. Page 91. And Paul, you would introduce the report, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report um, is, was written in response to the meeting in January. Um, it asked for um, officers to report back on specific parking problems that um, Brighton Sea Cadets um, were experiencing and had passed on to Councillor Theobald. And the, um, uh, the report basically looked at, looked at those. We had discussions with the Sea Cadets, um, and I, I spoke to the Sea Cadets myself. Um, it was, uh, became clear that they were asking for a 10 permits. Those permits were issued. Unfortunately, I wasn't at a committee myself um, in January, on the January meeting, and they, we actually issued those permits and then had to uh, get in contact with the, um, the, the sea cadets after it became clear that that hadn't actually been authorised by committee. So I would like to apologise to Councillor Theobald and committee for, for that error. But the uh, permits, now, in, in overall, when we looked at the, uh, asked them for their, to summarise their parking problems, it became clear that they were asking for 10 um, parking permits as well as a permit for a, um, a minibus, which it was felt when we looked at, at the same time we had another request from an, another organization, uh, the Open Church, asking for voluntary permits again um, to, to meet the, the needs of their volunteers. Uh, so overall, um, given that there could be further, further requests, it was felt that, that Partly the, this could be a particular issue for that particular area, uh, and as well as the, given that there was a, a, a full review of all parking permits that was due to report back to committee in October, uh, that the fairest, um, fairest thing to do, in effect, was to, to delay this decision until, uh, until a full re review of the permits was, um, was completed and reported back to committee, thereby taking into account the needs of all voluntary sector organisations um, and uh, with full discussion and reports back to committee so, as well. Thank you, Paul. That's helpful. Is it? Members got any questions first? No? Okay. Geoffrey. Yes. Um, first of all, I, I, I do want to... Uh, sorry. sorry, my apologies. First of all, I do want to move an amendment um, that the permits be issued to the sea cadets uh, uh, forthwith. Uh, I, I do accept that 
Paul Nichols was being helpful, and, uh, and I was very grateful to him when he told me that he'd sent the permits off to the sea cadets, and I thought that was, that was really good. Um, it then became rather embarrassing when the permits had to be uh, returned, and uh, I, I felt slightly sorry for Paul uh, being in that position. Uh, the, the will of this committee seemed to me quite clear, because Emma Daniel supported me at the last meeting, was for uh, permits to be issued to Brighton Sea Cadets. Um, it's such a long time ago that I first raised this. Uh, if we leave it until October, a good year would have gone, at least I would have thought. I have no problem with working out a report for the, for the whole of the, the city. No problem with that at all. But I do think, and I, I raised this one first because this was the one that came to me first, and I really felt quite strongly um, that we should be helping volunteers in this way. Now, it is true there are others, and indeed, I, I've since had one from... I mean, we didn't vote for all these parking schemes, and it's interesting that people are now coming forward um, from one in the uh, Lewis, uh, Stanford Avenue, the parking regulation mm -hmm. there. And I, and I fully sympathise with that one as well. Uh, and I said that I would bring this to committee and uh, mention it. But I do think that to resolve a lot of argy-bargy, for goodness sake, can't we just give these permits um, to this organisation and then have the full park permit policy review in October? And I'd like to move that, please. Okay. Thank you. Have we got a second for that? Yeah. Okay. Jill. Thank you. It's a, it is a difficult one, isn't it? Because um, I, I agree with the, the principle of the report that you don't want to set a precedent if you give permits to one voluntary organisation. There are already others waiting. Um, it would be difficult then to refuse permits for the other organisations. And it is probably best to look at this in the round as part of an overarching review. I was a bit um, disappointed to see that, that um, the results of that policy review wouldn't be reporting back to committee until October, um, which seems an awful long time away. And, I'm, and I am worried about the viability on this particular organisation that has been coming to the council and trying to work with us in order, in order to get some permits. Um, we are minded to support the amendment, but would it be possible to issue those permits to the Brighton Sea Cadets on the basis that it would be temporary pending the outcome of the review? And would that therefore be enough to um, send a signal to the other organisations that may come forward that, that this is, these are not being automatically granted on a, on a, a permanent basis um, and that there, would, there may well be a, a, a policy change when the review um, results are known, which I hope can be sooner than October. Well, we have had others asking since this whole issue, as you mentioned, as this issue has come up and, and got publicity. I suspect before October, if we did this, then we would have quite a queue formed. And I, think, I, I can't see how you could uh, say you were going to make this uh, available to this particular organisation and then refuse further applications from others unknown who come forward and plead just, just, just as a de deserving case. I, 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 excuse me. I, I think this is really dangerous in that we have, in our, we have enough detail in this report that tells us of the scale of the potential demand and also that we have hot spots of parking pressures within the parking zones and that residents are paying for parking permits. There's loads of other parking permits already in existence as well. And those parking permit holders will, will struggle with the idea of suddenly having uh, additional permits being issued without there being a proper review of the policy. I think, you know, yes, there's an election coming. I can see that. It's a very popular idea, isn't it? This is not the way to make policy. Yet. Just make the, the, the point... Yeah, I'm he, sorry, the statement's just been made about an election. I mean, quite frankly, Emma, in that Emma's, particular ward... I know, and Alan. Well, I've got Ian, Emma and Alan. <laughs> and then Geoffrey again. Well, so, so it's a question for a lawyer, really. So, yeah, if, if, if we... 
decide, if this committee decides to give away parking permits, I'm not exactly sure what the criteria for qualification would be, but what, what, what would the council's position be should other organisations, the highly likelihood that other organisations other, other organizations will come forward requesting such, mm -hmm. such, a, such a facility? So maybe Liz could answer that. <laughs> I'll try. Yeah, so the, the issue that that would create would be that the issuing a temporary uh, permit, um, you know, well, we, we don't know what, 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 what that would spark, whether that would spark challenges from others or not. But what it may do is spark applications from other people. The issue that we would have is if the council then said, no, we're unable to process those um, and we're not, we don't have a particular policy in, fr in place with specific criteria, the challenge that may be made is, well, as an authority, how do you demonstrate that you're acting rationally, reasonably within public law principles? And, and the reason that the council operates by virtue of having policies in place is in order to establish and follow um, a rational process. So, um, you know, the potential is that other applicants, if they are refused, may use the lack of policy to um, make a case that the council is operating unreasonably, irrationally, without a policy, um, and difficult to, to respond to that, um, hypothesizing because we haven't had any of those applications or challenges. I think that's very sound advice. And look, we all sympathize. And I, I, you know, we've made the commitment that we would look at the possibility of a, of a community permit within that review, and that's the proper way to go about this, I'm afraid. We have um, Emma. Okay, so I live quite close to that um, particular project, and as far as I'm aware, there, are, you know, there aren't that many other similar types of projects, but you, I think that you, sh you know, it could have been dealt with just a little bit smoother than having an argy bargy over this one. We could have probably done it without so much committee time being needed. But what I think is about is about social value. Now we have people coming in from outside of the city to deliver a service to children, some of whom suffer significant disadvantage, and this gives them a real sense of confidence. I think that we should have a consideration in that review of social value. I think it's just common sense to say that those, that group were, did expect and were led to believe they would get a permit to, so they could keep operating pending a review. And what we should say is, can we look at otherwise, can we look at some sort of financial support for that group? Because at the moment, they're not expecting much from us. They just don't want their volunteers to have to pay or get penalty tickets. So I think it's a question of just using some common sense and measurement to it. They were the ones that asked us, no other groups in other areas where CPZs have been brought in have made this, have, have asked for this so far. They're the ones that are the sort of first case, and I just feel we could be a bit more humane to them. That's all. We're not trying to be humane. No well, we just want to the, keep co this the consultation, safe. there's a big sign on a business on Lewis Road saying yeah. we weren't properly uh, included. People didn't listen to the small, minutiae effects that we had. And this organisation feels the same way. It's not my ward, but I would expect their ward councillors, where they're getting a benefit for the children in their wards, to be sticking up for them. Alan. Well, Emma said a lot of what I was going to say, but I, 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 is there no way then we could look at this on a case-to-case -case basis? I mean, if people come from, we seem to be saying we can't do this because everybody's going to want one. Well, you could do that with almost anything you do. You could say we can't let you do it because then everyone will want to do it. You don't know that everyone will want to do it. If someone, presumably, if someone comes to you and you don't feel they've got a justifiable case for a permit, you can tell them, no, you can't have a permit because we can't justify it because this, that or the other. But, you know, we seem to be saying we can't, we can't do what seems to, to, to my mind, to be a perfectly acceptable case here. We can't do that because everyone will want it. And then, you know, we can end, end up in, in, in all sorts of problems. Yeah, that's why we have proper policies and we don't make things up as we go along because they're not legally sound. Jeffrey. And look, to try and be helpful here. Sorry. I'm going to try and be helpful here because I, I've listened to what everyone has said. But first of all, I think terms like we're going to give away these permits, gosh, and this is dangerous, these are volunteers. Look how many millions we make out of all this. And we talk dangerous. about 
giving away and dangerous. I think this is very unfortunate terminology from a group of people who are trying their best to, to help young people. So I think that's most unfortunate language. But to be You're helpful... You're twisting this, Geoffrey, terribly. But to, I'm going to be I think helpful. that's very unhelpful. I, I listened to what, um, to what Jill has suggested on a sort of temporary basis, if that helps. I'm going to suggest that they be given... I'm going to pick a figure of five permits. Um, five permits on a temporary basis until a full review in October. Now, on that basis, I have no idea whether five is the appropriate number, but it just seems to me i will just pick that out of the air, if you like, because that would at least help five people coming in uh, to park. Five permits, and then in October, there will be a proper, uh, a, a proper policy. Now, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not going to sit here and argue with this uh, on, on the legal side of these things, but I believe that there's always a way, and lawyers, uh, especially local government lawyers, are trained to enable committees to do something rather than to restrict committees from wanting to do something. Uh, so with those kind words, I'm hoping Liz is going to put this into the right terminology. Well, can I ask and you I a question, Jeffrey? I think that if we do that... Um, Jeffrey, can I just ask a question? Because we've got, we've got your proposal... Now, what if somebody else applies no, we, well, before October? Do we well, give if them that five? No, well, if that happens, then you, by the time we get there, we're nearly at, well, six months away from October. You'll have your policy in place in October, won't you? We've already got two other applicants. Well, you, Are we going to give uh, them uh, to look, them? I, I'm, I'm moved this one. You're making it very difficult. I'm not. I'm, I'm, you I'm are, not. I want to be I'm, clear. Look, if we're making a policy look, here, I want I'm, to be I'm clear sorry, who this applies you're, you're to. You're one member, uh, you know, Chairman, in, in, in the committee here. And as I sense it, there is a will from at least one, two, three, four, five, six people here, which is a majority, to try and, and help this group. Yes, I'd like to help others, but this is the group that's here. As long as we get this report in October, I'm prepared to let that go, the others go, until October. And I would expect that to be here in October. But for this group, who I've been trying for, I don't know, six, nine months, I think they should be given a certain number of permits now especially as they were given some and then they were taken away. Now, I picked a figure of five. I don't know whether that's right or wrong, um, but to try and get, get committee support. They have those, those permits uh, on a temporary basis, if you like, until the full report in October. So just to be clear, what you've said is five for C cadets, but nobody else before October when we will have a... Uh, uh, the policy review. That's exactly, no, that's, that, I, I, we, that, that is your proposal. No, that's Just what for you, them and I no didn't, other I didn't introduce that. I didn't introduce those other words. I've, I think that I'd rather the solicitor. She, she's I'm, heard I'm, what I'm I've said. I'm going to ask for the legal advice once I'm uh, clear on your proposal. That is your proposal. Uh, yes. My, my proposal is I'm dealing with one application here, which is the C cadets. I'm dealing with them because I've been dealing with them the longest, uh, and I, I'm trying to be helpful. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm about to what Jill's very sensible point about being temporary, if you like, okay. if that helps. All right, I think we've, we've understood. Um, well, can you wait until we've had some legal advice about Jeffrey's proposal? Liz, are you okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so if the amendment is to provide that the committee agrees that five temporary um, parking permits provided to the Bryant and Sea Cadets um, from this date until October 2015. Um, I think my advice in relation to um, not having a policy in place stands, so that, that decision is made outside of uh, a policy that, that would um, be able to be referred to and explained to other applicants between now and October how we were making the decision. So my advice stands, but I believe that by restricting it to a temporary basis, that would very much limit any potential risk to the council. You think it would be yeah. a risk? So we wouldn't be able to put that in, that this, this offer yeah. is only for them? Oh, definitely, it, it, would, it, would, it would clearly make, reduce the, the, the risk and, and make it clear that it was time limited. Well, that, that, that's clear advice. So. Yeah. And, and it would be until the committee makes a decision following the October report. They're not going to be taken away on the day before the, uh, the committee. Chris. Oh. My points um, 
as coming to the committee for this mm. meeting um, is um, I can hear all what's being said and so forth, but um, we've got no indication that I can see in the report. Where are these people coming from that um, they need to part there? How, how far does the, um, the, the sea cadets, the... the, the uh, I think they so travel forth. in some distance, so, Chris. I don't think we have any issue with... Is it, is it, an, is it, an, is it a city-based one or is it for further? Can somebody tell me? I did say that in my, uh, maybe you weren't here, but I did say that in my initial one, they're coming from quite long distances. Yeah. Charles wants to offer us a bit of advice. Uh, if members can just, hang on, we have, officer wants to give us advice. Thanks. Um, just want a quick sort of thing to add, and that's maybe if we could add, if this is going to be approved, that they're subject to resident concerns, because officers have got concerns that the particular times this permit will be used will be six to eight period where a lot of residents are coming home from work. Um, we've reduced some of the roads by half, the parking in these roads. So we just maybe if that could be added as well as part of the sort of trial. Okay. Well, I, I think before we proceed to actually making the decision here, we need to actually have a little bit of a pause. I can see Liz is trying to scribble a recommendation. I'd like officers to have a chance to talk with her properly as well and for us to all consider what we're doing. So I propose we have an adjournment. Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Initially? Ten minutes? Yeah, because they need to talk to each other. You're making up a policy here, and we need to consider the implications of that. No, oh, ten minutes. I'm sorry. This is outrageous. Well, it's not I, I, outrageous, I, I, Jeffrey. I'm You've sorry. sprung this on us. I, I've moved this. This has been seconded. We've got six people wanting to vote for this. Yeah. With due respect to everyone else in this room, that should be... That sh that's it. I, I want... I, Given that you want to do this thing, and I know the way the votes are going to go, let's make sure it's as sound as possible. Let them talk to each other about this. Thank you. Must be getting. We've shortened that by three minutes. Huh? We've shortened that by three minutes. It's gone ten. No, you no. called it at 35 and it's. Yeah. So we've got three minutes until. <laughs> well, we won't. We'll wait. Um, we'll wait for members to be here to hear it. Anyway, she's coming now. Oh, God. Right. Okay. Right, Chris, order, please. Um, Liz has been working very hard here on um, an amendment. So the wording proposed is that the Environment, Transport and Sustainability Committee on the basis of the specific circumstances identified at committee, agrees to provide five temporary permits to Brighton Sea Cadets to be reviewed upon adoption of the parking permit policy in October 2015. Yeah, that's all right. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, well, that, that replaces the existing 2.1. Yeah. So if we wish to vote on that amended recommendation. Those in favour? Those against? Those abstaining? Okay. So that 
Recommendation is agreed. Okay. I'll just wait to hear from my residents about uh, parking pressure. So our next report... 94. Um, 94. 94, Sorenden Five Ways Residence Parking Scheme Consultation. And, uh, what? Sorry, we just need to change the recommendation, really. That was the only reason it was called, wasn't it? The last, the last one? Well, yes. that replaced the recommendation. 90, sorry, 94. Sorry. 94. I think, I think it was called just to change the recommendation. As I we did. We did. We don't want to hear from the officer first. No. Okay. So we. So the pro, the proposal is to, in some manner. I'm sorry, Liz. I should have asked you for potential wording here, to amend in the inclusion of Preston, of Hollingby Park Avenue and Terrace, because it's not shown on the map. So I don't know quite how we do that actually. Do we, do we, do I, would, I would add a specific additional recommendation that, that spells out the additional roads to be included that aren't shown on the plan. Okay. All right. Are we all clear on? Okay. So we can we can add an additional recommendation to say to literally just say in addition to those um, shown, shown on the map, point. this will also okay. include in those two all roads. Right. Well, okay. Right. Good. So those in favour? And those against? Yeah, you're supposed to vote against, Andrew. That's, that's customary. <laughs> okay. So that's... I would like clarification. How did Councillor Wheels vote in the end? There was a vote against on Councillor Wheels. <laughs> okay, that's that report. Um, have we got any left? Yeah, we've got Valley Gardens. Oh, blimey, so we have. We've got Valley Gardens to come, haven't we? Could I possibly forget? Number 95. On page 109. Um, Jim, if you'd like to present the report, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report is to partly update members on what's happened since our oh, last committee with the Valley Gardens project and also to ask for approval to progress the scheme to the next stage of design, which is technical design. If we get that approval, we will undertake the technical design and then come back to a future committee for approval to start construction or start work towards construction. Can you repeat that again, please? Can I? Oh, oh uh, the last sentence. Yeah, um, if assuming that we get approval to progress the next stage of design, we'll then do that and return to committee at a future date, hopefully in June, to feedback on, on more progress and ask for approval to progress the scheme to construction. To construction, yes. Okay. Um, so, just, sorry, Chair. Um, j just to give a quick overview of what we have been doing since since we were last at, um, at committee, we've we've had further workshops to develop a scheme with the community. The project management boards met several times, and minutes from that meeting has have been circulated to committee members. Uh, the local enterprise partnership confirmed our funding um, of eight million pounds. Uh, we've completed the procurement for the design team to progress the next scheme of design. So assuming that we get approval to progress today, we can start that stage. Uh, we've got a separate report going to Policy and Resources Committee in two days with the LTP allocation that would um, confirm the funding that we would give this next financial year to enable that work to take place. Okay. So just before I ask Jill to introduce her amendment, can you just remind us how much money is actually on the table now being put towards this by the local enterprise partnership. What do I mean? How much has been how much has been pledged? Eight million pounds for the scheme that we're looking at that are my reports about today, and potentially up to a future six million pounds for phase three, as when and if we prepare and submit a robust business case. Thank you. Right, Jill, you have an amendment to put. I do, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's 
It's a simple amendment and um, we are moving it because of our continuing concerns around the project. There is not um, agreement, cross-party agreement, from this committee on what is a major transport scheme proposal which could span at least five years for all three phases. And we believe that there has to be far greater uh, unity amongst us um, at the start of such a, a major undertaking. The Conservatives, I know, have got serious concerns around um, phase three and the potential removal of the Palace Pier, the Aquarium roundabout. And for our, um, with respect, Councillor Davey, the drawings that were before us when we took the decision to proceed with putting in the business plan were predicated on the removal of the Aquarium roundabout and it being replaced with a T-junction. This is phase that, one and two, James, that, nothing to do with the roundabout. That is what was taken. We have been allocated or earmarked six million for phase three on that basis, on that basis. Now, now, this is, now this is, this is, this is, well, this is an indication, Chair, of the confusion, I think, that is surrounding this, this project. For our part, we have concerns around the funding of the scheme in terms of the 25%, which is about three and a half, um, well, it's, it's just under four million that would have to come from this council's allocations of uh, local transport plan funding and from elsewhere. We also have concerns that the maintenance of the new gardens has no budget as yet and will have to be self-funding, but we don't quite know what the plans for self-funding the, uh, the maintenance will be. These are, these are central gardens in the middle of the city, but we don't have a budget to maintain them. And so given all of, all of these concerns and the fact that this, these recommendations here before us intend to cede the decision making around the design of the road layout to the project management board where there are already significant, dis significant concerns about the removal of so much road space, we have concerns around how the scheme is being governed. The fact that there is now um, opposition to the removal of the Mazda fountain indicates that the majority of the general public are simply not aware of the implications of the scheme and the impact that it is going to have. They've just started to wake up to it. And we are receiving lots of people who have got serious concerns. All our amendment does is to ask that no further decision making relating to expenditure on this scheme is taken until after the May election when a review can be made of the scheme, a quick but thorough review, where all parties can be involved, and that we can then go forward, I think, hopefully, in a more unified way. But as things stand at the moment, we feel that this is, this is an unsafe way. This is an unsafe way to proceed. I'm surprised you think that the public are not aware of it. This has been a huge amount of consultation. And I'm running into residents all the time. With respect, about Chair, this, so. the, the scheme has changed since the original consultation. It has changed considerably. Ian. Uh, Mr. Scott, please. Ian, you have a point to make. Does anyone else wish to speak? You need to put your hands up. I oh, beg your pardon. Seconded, yes. Yes, you have. No? Okay, got that. All right, all right. Then we can pass. Yeah. Ian. Oh, Alan, that's sad if you think that. <laughs> I, I must admit, I really can't understand Councillor Mitchell and Councillor Morgan's continued opposition to this project and their determination to scrap it. And I think Councillor Morgan was quoted in, the, in, in that um, great newspaper, the Argus, as saying that he, was, he would scrap this project should they came in. And presumably he would return eight million to the local enterprise partnership and say that we don't want the other six million. And particularly as I was, when I was clearing up my covers the other day, I found a local transport plan from 2006 with, 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 with Councillor Mitchell's lovely picture in the front uh, where she first introduced the idea of, of the Valley Gardens project uh, and, and said how it was such an important part of, 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 of their plans to improve accessibility, air quality, congestion, road safety and quality of life in this city. And in the detail within that plan, they spoke 
The considerable rationalisation of carriageway and its junctions means that potential exists for improved traffic flow with an overall reduction in carriageway space. And I do recall that, Ke that Councillor Mitchell said to me personally when I was elected in 2007, you said to me, Jill, you will help us get Valley Gardens delivered, won't you? And that's exactly what I, and I said yes, and, I, and, I, and, we, and I and we have been following up on that promise I made to you in 2007. And you know, looking back through some older copies of, of the Argus online, I found what Councillor Mitchell said in 2008 in criticising the then administration, saying we will never now see the bold and ambitious plans for more public space in Valley Gardens become a reality. Well, well now it's you that you, know, you were criticising the administration then for not delivering on these plans. And now it's you that are stopping on the delivery, trying to stop the delivery of these plans. And it is totally perplexing to me why you wish to do so. And you know, you know, it's clear that there is a real need for improvements in this area. We've shown the improvements that have already been achieved at the level, and, and there's great work going on at St. Peter's Church, and this will take this all the way down to the seafront eventually. It's a once-in-a-generation opportunity for, for this city. I find it you know, a real betrayal of this city, to be perfectly honest, and a betrayal of the good work that actually you did when you were in the position that Pete is now in, in, in you know, when you were responsible for transport. And I, I find it really, really sad, actually, that now you're trying to make political gain, cheap political gain, and scrapping this project. Thank you, Ian. Alan. Well, I'm, I'm down to second this, but we've had our, I suppose, our thirds before our seconds, so I don't know. Um, but it, it, what Jill's saying here is not that we scrap it at all. It says that all decisions making related to the expendi expenditure on Valley Gardens transport scheme is halted until the forthcoming elections to enable a thorough review of all three phases of this major scheme, terms of finance, design and governance to be carried out. If it's a good idea now, it will still be a good idea at the end of May. And if it's such an evidently good idea that everyone's saying, then it will still be such an evidently good idea at the end of May. And whoever's in administration, it would be stupid not to carry it forward. All this is saying is that we halt it now until we get a chance to review it after the next election. I don't see as that's a major problem to anyone. We're not talking about scrapping it or sending money back or anything here. We're just talking about this. But Councillor Morgan isn't on this committee. This, this, this has come, Graham, if, this if has come forward. Put your hand up, this, this, this has come forward for this committee to see. Not, not. I mean, whatever Councillor Morgan thinks or doesn't think isn't for this committee, is it? Chris, thank you, Chair. I'll be into general discussion now, as well as the amendment. Get the amendments at the end. Yeah, thank you. Yes, um, but earlier, uh, one of the things I found in this council experience is it's often paradoxical. And earlier in this meeting, we heard Councillor Mitchell suggesting we go out hither and thither to get together um, 28,000 or 82,000 or something for um, things, get money in. But now this is tantamount to sending them rather larger sums of money back. The LEP and so forth, when they get wind of this, they'll think, what's going on down in Brighton? We're offering them this, and now they're having second thoughts. Um, I'm, I'm flabbergasted. Um, and to pick up on what um, Ian said, I remember sort of the early two, you know, 2001 times about that time, Simon Fanshaw and other Labour people were touting Brighton and Hove and Port Slade as being players on the world stage, which is rather an extravagant phrase. But what I'm hearing from Labour now is the very opposite of the world stage. They want to shrink things back to a small town, whereas I think... Um, this is one of the most exciting things. Again, when I was reading the report, I thought this could be, I can picture it, it could, this could be really marvellous. The Steen back in the early 19th century when Henry James visited in the 1870s, it was a place where people perambulated, it was a place where people met. Um, and it's all, sh it's, a, it's a no man's land, no person's land now between two um, sides of um, Brighton. So I regard this as an absolutely great chance to make something wonderful happen. Um, indeed, only the other day I was coming back down Edward Street on the bus, and when I get off, got off, I remarked to the driver about, that was really nice coming down there now, and um, this is the geek in me coming out. And he said, absolutely, and he looked forward to the rest of that whole area taking a similar um, improvement to Edward Street, a place that will flow. It will be a narrower traffic line, but we'll have traffic flow. This is um, the point of it. No, we have general discussion now. And um, 
Anyway, so I'm, I really look forward to this happening, and I think the, this seeds of doubt, and I just don't quite see why the election bears upon it, because we've taken it this far, and um, it's all got agreement on it. It's, um, it's a, a red herring, and um, a great, great, I think it could sabotage something terrific coming ahead. Thank you, Chris. Jill, anxious Thank you. to say more? No, no, no. I, I just wanted to come back a little bit on um, Ian's comments. He's quite right to waive the um, local Labour's, I think it was last transport plan at me. He could also have waived our city plan or, or local plan at me, which included Valley Gardens improvements. He could also have waived our manifesto 2011 back at me. Fully accept all of that. We've always said Valley Gardens needs improvement. But those were the days when, A, we had urban realm funding. It was a specific pot. We were lucky. There was more money around. Now we're having to peg, peg, peg everything um, on um, the uh, economy and how any scheme is going to boost the economy. And we are having to make contributions locally to any funding pots that we get from the Local Enterprise Partnership. If any councillors here would like to look at the local, enterprise, the, uh, local transport plan funding report that is going to PNR in two days' time, you will see that, it's, that it is having to pay back money, 1.4 million, that was borrowed from this year's allocation for last year, and it is borrowing almost the equivalent amount from next year's allocation to fund this year. And all, the, and all the while, we are having to spend allocations of funding for the next five years on Valley Gardens. And it is not set out in that report how this is going to be done. This, this is the only point I am making. We need to see a flowchart of how this five-year scheme is going to be funded year on year on year. We need to know how these new gardens, beautiful pictures in front of us, but we need to know where the money is coming from, from their maintenance. And if it's going to be self-funding, what is that self-funding scheme going to look like? And we need to review the governance to ensure that more people in Brighton and Hove actually understand what is going on. And I think we need to perhaps consult again on some of the changes that have been made. That's all, Chair. Thank you, Jill. Have we any other contributions to this debate? Yeah, go ahead, Graham. I, I, I've, seen some, I've seen the Council and, and members of all parties at their best in my three and a bit years on it, and I've seen some things members of all parties have done not so well, including me. Um, but today's tawdry spectacle from, and I don't really blame uh, Councillor Mitchell, it's obvious that this has been instigated by Councillor Morgan, who's sat in the back making sure she follows his orders. But I, I, I think that the time will come when you will be embarrassed by this. Um, it, it seems to be fig leaf up a fig leaf to find a way of opposing this until election day so that you can say to the electorate, um, we're opposed to it, and then as soon as the election's over, you seem to be suggesting you're supported again. Um, well, that's on the one hand what you seem to be saying, and on the other hand, you seem to be saying you're opposed to it. How, the, how, when all you say about the shortage of money and so on, you can be putting at risk £8 million and this city's credibility, £8 million from the Local Enterprise Partnership, and our credibility for the next five to ten years with the Local Enterprise mm -hmm. Partnership, because they will never, ever give us any money again if you play games and get away with this. Um, how you can do that and present yourselves as a reasonable, sensible um, party fit to run this city is completely beyond me. And I think, uh, I think you will be embarrassed in the long term when you look back on this, because I know you've done a lot of good work. Every word you said about this, I, I agree with up till now. And how you've been talked into taking this bizarre stance is completely beyond me. Um, we, we shall be supporting it. We could go for some short-term electoral popularity, I'm sure we have a few emails about it, you know, the bonkers greens, why are you supporting them and all that sort of stuff, but we're not going to do it because we're going to do the right thing for the city. And I think, um, I think it's very embarrassing that the Labour group are not. Thank you, Graham. Alan, you want to... Well, yeah, Alan had indicated before. And then, thanks, and then thanks very much. Very considerate of you. I mean, I don't understand that... I don't feel one bit embarrassed by this. And... I don't understand how we can be accused of courting popular um, 
boat chasing by, by, uh, by saying we, 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 we want to put a halt to this, and at the same time, you telling us that this is very popular. If it's very popular, then the worst thing we could do would be to say that we, we, we were against it, because surely that would have the exact opposite to chasing votes. That would be, ex you know, that would be flying in the face of, um, of, of a popular and, and well thought out scheme. Thank you. Geoffrey. Yes. Um, can I make one thing absolutely clear at the beginning? Um, we do not have in front of us the, the aquarium roundabout or the very beautiful fountain, which is at Old Steen. We oppose uh, any change to the aquarium roundabout. I would certainly oppose anything to do with that fountain, which I regard as beautiful. Now... Chill, chill. You were talking about... That's again See, a misleading thing. I'm talking, about a, I'm talking about the fountain at the Old Steen, not the Mazda fountain. And this is where the confusion is lying. And I'm, so, I'm trying to say very clearly where we stand on this. And we certainly are against any changes to the Aquarium Roundabout and any changes to that beautiful fountain, um, the one which is to the south of North Street, to the south of St. James's Street. Mm -hmm. I think people are being confused, quite frankly. Now, Councillor Morgan has tweeted, and I notice he's here today, sitting through this meeting rather than being at the Strategic Partnership. And that's interesting in itself, saying, twittering, that that fountain uh, and the Aquarium Roundabout are at risk. That is just not true. This is not before us. And certainly we are very, would be very much against now, what I've said before is that, and I went again, I, I, I dropped my wife down at, the, uh, at Brighton University I took my, with the car, and I drove round again the route, the route north. And first of all, you have to, to make sure you're in the right lane, that you go left and you don't go right to Lewis, then you go up a little bit further and you've got to make sure you're in the right lane and not the left lane so that you don't go up St. James's Street. The whole route is tortuous. As I've said before, I tried walking, or I did walk from Brighton Railway Station down to Falker Street, very, very nice, lovely, past Pelham Square, and then I attempted to cross to go uh, up, to, up to Edward Street and along that way. I found trying to get across uh, very, very difficult, quite frankly. I can't think that there is anyone there who can really think that the scheme works at the moment. Now, we have this amendment in front of us that it does absolutely nothing because, as my colleague has already said, this enables the Labour Party to say, well, um, one part of them saying we're against it. We hear today Councillor Robbins saying, no, we're not against it. And then after the election, once the election's gone and all those people who, who think that it's not a good idea, uh, will have, they hope, will have supported them. And then after the election they'll come along and support it. Uh, that is not the right way to be going about, uh, about, uh, about business. It, it, it really isn't. Um, and, what, and, and as far as this uh, amendment is concerned to defer it until May, we're already in March now. Matters are coming to this committee regularly. We haven't actually seen. I myself want to be absolutely sure, absolutely sure, that it is traffic neutral. I mean, no party can, and no person can have been stronger on the, on the fact that this should be traffic neutral. And that, we, and that will be coming back again and again before the scheme is implemented. What we don't want to do, we've already heard about what a difficult economy we've got and things, and the situation we have is eight million pounds coming forward to this scheme. If we don't take it, will that ever come back again? I don't think it ever will. And I want to see uh, those pavilion gardens actually used for what they were intended to be used for. And I want to see a much clearer. Friends of mine who go to conferences in Brighton have said to me, how on earth when you drive back up that, it's a nightmare. And I've said, yes, it is a nightmare. But we're now trying to do something about it. Thank you, Geoffrey. I've got Lizzie. I'd, I know Jill has asked again, but that would probably be about the third or fourth contribution. So I'm... Sorry, I won't, I won't accept that, Lizzie. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, first of all, I'd like to be very clear what the implications are of, um, of the delay and just how damaging it could be, because I'm under the impression that nothing is actually cast in stone as yet, and that all options are still open, and um, any, any, any questions about features, whatever, can be ironed out in the design stage. Um, but I also am a bit curious as to why the Labour Group haven't brought this up during the project board meetings. I understand that Colin, that Councillor Robbins, who is actually seconding this amendment, has a place on that project board, but hasn't attended meetings, is that correct? And, and therefore, could these questions not have been raised already mm. at the project board meetings? Um, mm. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm asking, asking the question, so I'd welcome the answer. Thank you. I'll, I'll allow you to answer that specific okay. question. We've had concerns. We've had concerns about this. We've had concerns about this scheme from the beginning. We, we, when, when the, when the um, report first came to this committee to set up a project board, it was couched in terms of um, a gagging order being placed on that project board. Um, the only person that was allowed to speak about the Valley Garden scheme was the chair of the committee to the press. I'm afraid this is true. You can check the past papers. Um, to the press was only the chair of the committee. All decisions were to be taken by the executive director, Jeff Raw, and therefore the whole five-year scheme was being ceded over to a senior officer and the chair. We at committee amended that. Counsel Councillor Theobald objected to it and, and we amended that. However, the Labour Group still retained serious concerns at the governance and the decisions. The decisions on traffic ne neutrality are being ceded to the project board, not this committee, Councillor Theobald. That's what's in front of you. The project board are going to agree the designs. The designs will remove the road space. That will affect traffic neutra neutrality. It is not coming to this committee. And therefore, it would have okay, been, Jill, it would you. have been hypocritical of us, Councillor Dean, it would have been hypocritical of us, given the level of these concerns, for us to have taken a place on that project board and opposed this right. project, okay. which is why we didn't take the seat. You've, you've explained your position. Thank you, Joe. Well, that, I'm sorry, but that implies a gagging order actually at the project board. You can speak at the project board. You can put these points forward. So I'm still, through you, Chair, I'm still equally as confused because that, I don't believe that Councillor Mitchell has fully answered my question. Partly, yes, in terms of who can speak to the press or whatever. I'm not talking about who speaks to the press or whatever. I'm talking about discussions at the project board where all these concerns can be ironed out during the different stages before it ever comes to this committee or even goes anywhere near the press. Well, they questioned the legitimacy, so they weren't prepared to participate. Emma. Um, so just as a follow-up to the point that um, Councillor Theobald made around traffic neutrality, my understanding is that the committee won't see anything else around traffic neutrality. Could we get a clarification from officers or yourself, Chair, as to whether the scheme is traffic, has that element in, or when we will see it, when we will get the opportunity to look at that? Well, these are all questions that could have been raised by your party in the right place. The, well, this the is a committee meeting. Is, is I am an elected councillor. This design. paper is in front of me. Please can you offer to answer it? Jim. I think the the scheme, the current scheme, was actually agreed by this committee back in June. The, the revised road layout was, revi was um, yeah, by, by this committee. And it's, it's actually set out, I mean, just so that people are clear of the decision-making process. Um, I've made a note in Appendix 1, and I think it was June or Ju July this year that we brought that uh, revision to the committee to seek approval. Yeah. It, will, it, will, it will come back here before um, implementation. You, Ian? Yeah? It was always, if I may, it, it was always agreed that any major changes to what has been put before us or any, any major stages will be brought back to this committee. And, and it's been said that it will be brought back to the next, next committee answer, meeting. Emma. Mark Pryor, Mark Pryor wishes to respond. 
I'd just like to sort of clarify and confirm, and hopefully, Jim, you can uh, also confirm, that one of the guiding principles of the scheme is for traffic ne ne neutrality. Uh, any major uh, design changes that Jim has, has already outlined, but even sort of major stages in the scheme prior to construction would need to come back to this committee. So traffic orders and detailed design, all those aspects would, would come back to committee. Okay. All right. Oh. Well, he was trying to be helpful there because he goes to the meetings. I'd like to make it clear why I didn't want to attend the meetings. Everybody's told me why I didn't want to attend them, but I'll tell you why I didn't want to attend them. I don't know how many of you are, are, um, are familiar with the Ragged Trails of Philanthropists. Can it but be there's a committees point, that, Alan, because Well, if you shut up, I'll do it. Right? Give me two minutes. To debate, right? There's, a, there's a, a place in there where Councillor Weakling goes to the project boards and is, is constantly outvoted by uh, councillors Grindham and Didlam. And I didn't want to go to a project board where I would be playing Councillor Weakley to everybody else in Grindham and Didlam. Okay, right. Well, I want to wrap this up, actually, because I think positions are fairly clear. And I just want to say that I think that this project, on top of everything we've done so far, is actually another step. Uh, it is of such significance. Um, what we have is a shabby mess um, in the centre of our, in the heart of our city. Um, and that we want to make it a place that people want to be in. And it needs to be a fitting welcome to all the millions of visitors. You go to any European city or any major city in this country now, you will find a centrepiece welcome. And that is what Valley Gardens will be. We have been working on this for years. We have the money now, and we need to get on with this. Um, and I'm very, very sorry that the Labour Party would seem to be playing politics with that opportunity. And as has been said, our credibility as a city is at stake here. Um, and it's just a shabby matter. And I actually think from a political position, having been standing on people's doorsteps, they are making a massive judgment call in the wrong direction because people are with us. They want this sorted out. They want that to be right. They don't want to be messing around and potentially losing the money to do it. So, and I think that the, uh, you know, what they're angling for is the opportunity to scupper this because they're in the vain hope that they will be in the administration after May. Well, we need to proceed. So, we have the amendment to take a vote on, first of all. So, uh, excuse me, I'm going to put the amendment to the vote. So those in favour of the amendment, please show. Okay, those against? That's it. Thank you. The amendment is lost. Uh, we have the recommendations before you that we uh, note the progress uh, since 2014 and that we um, agree the next stage uh, to move to technical designs as, as before you. So those in favour, please show. And those against? Right. Well, we are on camera, so that's recorded. Thank you very much. Well, I, th I think you will have to answer for your decision here, quite honestly. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. I think that concludes our business, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So, hang on, hang on, hang on. We haven't finished. One more item to go with. Have members any items they wish to refer to council? We'll notify the um, committee clerk if we have. Okay. Thank you. Right, I'll call the meeting to a close. Thank you very much. <laughs>